Are we recording? Yeah. So this time out, we want to talk about the supreme ruler, some might even call him a dictator, of our Baltic neighbor, Latvia. While generally a peaceful country, in recent times it has seen the rise of a despotic leader. What who... do you say? What's that? What the Latvia you say? Oh, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not Latvia, which is still a peace-loving and beautiful country with a democratically elected government. No, no. <laughs> This time out, we're going to be talking about Latveria, the fictional Eastern European country and its sovereign king, the kind but strict Dr. Victor von Doom. He, who is not only the Fantastic Four's primary adversary, but also widely regarded as the premier villain throughout the Marvel Universe. But who is this maniacal despot? This benevolent king who, if not beloved, is mostly respected by his subjects. Where did this masked, ironclad, and green-cloaked madman come from? Well, I'm Professor Jack, and this time on Generation Geek, we're going to find out. To get to the bottom of this, we have to go back to the start of the Marvel Age of Comics. Way back in 1961, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby teamed up to co-create the Fantastic Four, a group allegedly created in response to the success rival company DC was having with their Justice League of America. The difference, of course, was that while the Justice League was made up of established heroes, all of whom are already successful in their own books, the Fantastic Four was something, well, different. They were brand new characters for a start, even if the Human Torch did take his name and powers from an earlier character. They were also mostly a family, led by Reed Richards, the uh, super smart brains of the outfit. There was a romantically involved couple along with his best friend and her kid brother, and for the first few issues, they didn't even have costumes. But if they were created to compete with that other team, they certainly succeeded. From the start, they were popular and gathered more readers each issue, which meant that by the time we get around to issue five, with the basics in place, the uniforms, the familial squabbling and bickering, we needed a villain to step up and really give these up and coming superhero superstars a run for their money. Or, as Stan Lee put it, we had to find a supervillain that would totally turn on the minions of Marveldom. Because the thing is, really, without a good villain, the hero isn't really anything. You're only as good as your adversary. And if they're easy to defeat, what does that say about you? That's why villains, especially good villains, good villains? <laughs> keep coming back again and again to challenge the heroes and, ultimately, make them better. All of which brings us back to 1962 in issue 5 of the Fantastic Four. With the book a success, Lee and Kirby needed a new bad guy. Lee, who is a self-described name freak, gets stuck on the word doom, figuring it could somehow play into what they were trying to do. It just needed something, as he says, to give it more oomph. Doom Man didn't seem to do the trick, and Mr. Doom didn't quite have it, Lee explains in the book Bring on the Bad Guys. They tossed aside Professor Doom and even Donald Doom, which had the alliterative flair Lee loved, but wasn't going to cut it. I mean, come on. Fear the evil Donald Doom! Eh, it just doesn't fill one with elemental dread, now does it? But then, scant seconds before I'd be forced to resort to Doom the Dentist, I had it! Dr. Doom, eloquent in its simplicity. Magnificent in its implied menace. The name was good, but it was going to take more than a name to create a character who would go on to become, arguably, the best villain in the Marvel Universe. We'd make him far more than just the usual stereotyped mad scientist, Lee continues. We'd give him a mysterious past, a, a secret cache of unlimited wealth, a face too gruesome for the reader to behold, and an ego so great it would match that of Reed Richards himself. Not a small feat by any stretch of the imagination. When they decided to make Doom an old schoolmate of Richards, that was the first step of what would ultimately lead to Doom's greatness. On page four of that first issue, after the FF had been captured by Doom, Reed hears and recognizes the voice as his old college classmate, 
Victor Von Doom, and gives readers a five-panel summary of the man's origin story. One, which, like the infamous Batman origin, which we'll cover in another episode, is set up in such a way as to give just enough information to let the original readers back in 1962 get an idea who this guy is, but open enough that it could be exploited and expanded upon for the next six decades and still not really touch on all aspects of the possibilities it presents. As Stan Lee explains, I wanted a saga of epic proportions, one that would make the reader really understand what motivated him, what had turned him into a villain, what made him the tragic, tortured tyrant he was. I wanted the kind of story that would have made a perfect 1940s movie. And I think he succeeded. In fact, Abraham Reisman, in a 2017 Vulture article, makes the claim that Doom looms above all other bad guys as the closest thing to the platonic ideal of a supervillain that the genre has ever seen. It's high praise indeed. So let's take a look back at how it all started. Reed Richards tells us there in Fantastic Four number five that Doom was a brilliant science student who was fascinated by sorcery and black magic, but was only interested in forbidden experiments. Then he gets a bit judgmental. One night, the evil genius went too far as he brought forth powers which even he could not control. Yeah, there was an explosion, scarring Doom's previously handsome face, and Doom was expelled. When he was last heard from, he was prowling the wastelands of Tibet, still seeking forbidden secrets of black magic and sorcery. It's in those wastelands where a secret sect of Tibetan monks not only taught him the magic, but helped him fashion the now iconic armor he wears, ensuring no one will ever look on his scarred face. These basic facts, these bullet points or sign markers remain throughout. But the details, uh, the tidbits, which fill in the gaps are where things start to get really interesting. At one point, as those details started to get filled in, there's a scene where Reed, as a curious fellow student, points out a mistake in Doom's calculations, which Doom dismissed out of hand. But then, after the explosion, sees Richards forever as the cause of Doom's own failure, thus explaining the animosity and hatred towards Marvel's perennial father figure. All the writers who have come since Lee and Kirby have left their own indelible mark on the villain, casting him into more and more tragic circumstances, from being trained by Doctor Strange to take over as the Sorcerer Supreme, to being the herald for Galactus, the celestial being who eats planets. But in all these various incarnations, Victor Von Doom always ends up returning to square one to being the guy who knows he's the smartest guy in the room and that everything he does, no matter how seemingly evil, is really, in Doom's eyes, being done for the benefit of the people over whom he desires control and power. This goes back to day one. Okay, sure, there were some early foibles, like when he found himself in Fantastic Four number 16, miniaturized and in an alternate microscopic universe where he discovered himself in a primitive, happy world. He notes that their happiness was enough to make my blood boil, and then continues by exclaiming, the fools. They live in peace. They are so contented and happy, but I'll soon put a stop to that. Granted, it's a little over the top, but then again, when he becomes king of Latveria, we get little glimpses into the life his subjects lead. There's the little boy who is astonished when Doom walks by, pointing out the monarch to his mother, who admonishes the boy quietly saying, hush dear, you must be silent when the master passes. While in the same panel, another citizen thinks that ours has been a prosperous land since he has ruled us. Doom himself sees the irony as when uh, upon regaining the crown in Fantastic Four number 268, after some usurper or other has tried to steal it, he notes the rule of doom is restored. The people prosper once again. The fields are much with grain. The shops bulge with luxuries. Once more, there is no crime, no hunger, no unemployment in all the land. The process of rebuilding Doomstadt, and what a name for the capital city, right? The process of rebuilding Doomstadt goes quickly. The people are happy and content, as I have commanded they be. He was doing so great up until that last line, wasn't he? But that's it. That's doom in a nutshell. He can't help himself. However, this brings us back around to where we started, the country of Latveria, 
certainly based on Eastern Europe and located ostensibly in the Carpathian Mountains. But Varia first shows up in 1964 in Fantastic Four Annual Number 2 when Stan and Jack finally get the chance to give us Doom's origin story the way they always wanted. Here we find out that young Victor Von Doom was born into a band of traveling people known as Romani. His mother, who we don't actually meet in this particular origin story, remember this tale is ripe for adding details, and the details of Doom's mother were added much later, done very well in the six-part Ed Brubaker, Pablo Raimondi 2006 miniseries The Books of Doom. But Doom's mother is a witch who makes a pact with the devil, in this case Mephistopheles, to learn about the dark powers of magic. Alright, the Marvel Universe has a lot of devils, just don't ask. As with all deals with the devil, any devil really, things go wrong. And when Victor is just a boy who really loves his mommy, she is whisked off to hell to be tortured eternally. Now, this isn't something which is going to sit easy with the young Doom. And while he's going to certainly hold a grudge about this, he still has his father, Werner von Doom, who is a good man, a healer, if not an outright doctor, to guide and temper him. So far we're in Disney territory, right? Mom gone, dad's a good guy who tries hard. So of course, as the traveling band makes its way into Latveria, the baron of that country seeks out the senior Von Doom to use his mystical, magical, Romani healing powers to cure his sick wife. When Werner explains the hopelessness of the situation that it is beyond my power to save her, the baron responds the way all good crime bosses do, and we get the obvious threats. You lie, gypsy. Use your magic potions, save her, or you'll pay with your own worthless life. Naturally, the woman dies, and the Baron sends troops out after Werner von Doom, attacking him and leaving him mortally wounded, which naturally leads to a deathbed utterance, probably one of my personal favorites in the history of Doom. Werner, with his dying breath, says, You must protect, protect, and then he dies, right? <laughs> young Doom, of course, being egotistical and young, immediately tries to put his father's fleeing soul at ease by saying, Father, none will have to protect me. I shall become powerful, strong. I shall avenge your death. And then the kicker, Boris, who we already know is the adult Doom's most loyal and trusted advisor, maybe even as close as the man has ever come to having an actual friend, explains to the reader through his unspoken thoughts the truth of the situation. He did not mean protect the boy. He meant the world must be protected from the son who bears the name Von Doom. And there it is. The final piece of the Doctor Doom puzzle. The key to understanding the man, at least mostly. Everyone knows he's horrible. Everyone knows he's just not a good guy. But they stand behind him anyway. Eh, maybe for fear of incurring his wrath? Maybe because they actually think it's for the best? We'll never know. But we see it over and over. We saw it earlier when the citizens of Latveria were praising him for bringing prosperity to the country, a country he literally took from the Baron who had by then become king while exacting his promised revenge. We see it when he leaves the monastery which built him the armor. They're almost sad to see him go and yet understand that Woe to the world now that Dr. Doom is born. We even see it on the world stage. As Reed Richards explains the trouble of capturing and holding Doom for his crimes in the US. As head of a foreign nation, no matter how small, he is entitled to diplomatic immunity in this country. This is the dichotomy of Doom. Despotic dictator and righteous ruler and vicious villain who will be vexing the Marvel Universe for some time to come. So, until next time, wave your Latvian flag and proudly display your Doomstadt souvenirs. I'm Professor Jack, this is Generation Geek. If you like what you just saw, Remember to hit the subscribe button and click for notifications so that you'll know every time Generation Geek has a new video out. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're there. And if you want to meet us in person, come check out Comic-Con Baltics this year. We'll see you there.